Thank you very much. Um, I was listening to this talk and thinking, how are we going to follow this? I, I can't see the connection, but now I can because of the last comment you made. You know, I'm not an evolutionary anthropologist, but my, I think my colleagues would say we, we are in some ways a product of human technology because there's so much research about the ways in which human evolution is intertwined with tool use. So we are kind of, in part, self-made and, and prosthetic in that sense. So I think that's really provocative because the subject that Craig and I are going to talk about is um, body and sport in Greek antiquity. And today, and the first thing I want to say is I'm not a classic specialist and I'm not a specialist in sports, but I am an anthropologist who's very much interested in uh, what the body can tell us about the status of the person in society. And so that's my kind of, my segue into this subject matter. Um, that's, that's something that I'm interested in and I, and I think about continually. What about the, the body and the way the body is conceptualized and talked about and the practices of the body, what do they show us about the status of the person in a particular society? And clearly, um, from everything we can see about the way the body is, is used and depicted uh, in, in Greek culture, in ancient Greek culture, and I would say modern Greek culture, since that's my research interest, um, is very revealing and, and can tell us an awful lot about the way in which we bring those ideas forward into contemporary times. So the status of sport in ancient Greece, I'm borrowing some notions from a classic scholar from up the road in Urbana, David Sansone, who describes sport in ancient Greece as a ritual sacrifice of human energy. And this is kind of a provocative statement, um, but I think it's a really useful one. It helps us understand just that incredibly important role that sport played in ancient Greek society, um, which has resonances with today, and Craig's going to talk more about that. Uh, we see it in uh, not just the status of the body in sport, but in you know what, what was at stake? What were people striving for? Um, you see here in this picture, these two wrestlers are competing over that cup. It's a sacrificial vessel. Might this be the origin of the Stanley Cup? Sacrificial vessels were a very common form of prize, so we start to see this intertwining of ritual aspects and sport. In other words, sport is not separate from ritual or religious activity. Sporting events were at their heart religious events. So if sport is a ritual sacrifice of human energy, then what's the status of the athlete? And one of the things we can say about the athlete in ancient Greece is that he, and I'm using the word advisedly, is an embodiment of virtue, arete. Virtue is both a moral concept, moral worth, but also a physical concept. So the physical is meant to reflect the moral. So physical beauty, strength, perfection, uh, both in how you look and how you perform, is meant to reflect on your moral worth. From a ritual standpoint, the athlete is both sacrificial victim. If sport is a ritual sacrifice, that's what's being sacrificed. It's his bodily energy, blood, sweat, and tears. And he's the sacrificer. So he's this interesting dual position. Whoever is the winner, the champion, is worthy of being dedicated to the gods. And so the bodily signs of the ritual status of the athlete that I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to talk about three. There are other things we could say. But three is always a nice number for these kinds of presentations. So the first one is nudity. The second one, anointing with olive oil, which is such a prominent part of Greek athletics. And then decoration with crowns, like you know, laurel leaves, olive leaves, and fillets, these woolen bands. And you can see in this illustration, I think you can see a little bit the red color. This athlete here, and you can tell he's the athlete because he's the nude one, is being decorated with woolen bands and fillets, and we'll talk about the status of that. And I, I do want to say, if there are any classic scholars in the room, I would love it if you would chime in because um, I'm about up to here, you know, in terms of my expertise. I don't, I don't necessarily have a handle on this, except for the ways in which ancient practices resonate with modern Greek practices. All right, so nudity, clearly the word for nudity, the word for naked in Greek, gymnos, gives us gymnastics, gymnasium. Being naked, you know, is a characteristic of being an athlete. That's 
they're, the words are interchangeable because of this tight connection. Sansone speculates that this may be connected to initiation rituals, although he's not entirely sure. And so this, this line drawing taken from a, a Greek ceramic shows athletes getting nude, anointing themselves with that olive oil, preparing. Nudity then is, you know, a way of setting off, um, marking yourself as distinctive. Athletes applied olive oil before competition and then they would scrape it off along with all the sweat and the dust afterwards with this tool called a strigil, and that's what this athlete's doing in this picture. What's interesting is that Greeks also anointed statues of gods. And I hope you can hear when I'm using the word anoint and I'm using that word deliberately, we have a lot of ritual connotations with this word, right? It came through Christianity, right? Christos means the anointed one. So this carries over. We have a lot of associations with anointing. So if, if athletes are anointed in a special way, that's marking the body. Something special is happening here. Now the woolen fillets, what's interesting, here on the right is an athlete who's wearing woolen bands, red woolen bands. Over here it's a little harder to see, but these women are decorating sacrificial bulls with woolen fillets. So this is the aspect of the athlete as sacrificial victim. That's what's being highlighted, <coughs> being decorated with the same kind of thing, drawing it into the same context. And of course the crowns of laurel and olive, which are such a symbol of victory. And again, Christian thought borrowed those, right? In a lot of different contexts, martyrs as victors being crowned. Again, these crowns of vegetation, they could be olive leaves, they could be laurel leaves. These are also ritually important. Priests and priestesses would wear these crowns in the context of conducting sacrifice, and here you see a victorious athlete offering a burnt sacrifice. And here's the winged goddess. Nike, we would say. I wouldn't say that personally in Greek pronunciation, but that's how we know her winged victory. So again, you see that the athlete is both sacrificial victim and sacrificer, marked out by bodily signs, nudity, anointing, special decorations that signify the athlete's ritual status. And all of this is to serve a notion that the athlete, in both their physical aspect and their moral conduct, um, are an embodiment of the highest possible virtue that somebody could reach in society. And I think this is a good point okay. at which to let Craig take over. I'm going to bring up his slides. Thank you. What did you call I think yours? I think it starts with Greek. Okay. The Greek yep, ideals of there, athletes? There we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, since I have no technological, I do have some of my students in here know that I don't mess with PowerPoint. I feel very uncomfortable with it. You just and, give me one of these and, and I'll Dr. Glaros is going to uh, bring me and glide me through the presentation. But uh, I'd like to start this one. I think this was a perfect way to go off of uh, uh, what Angela was just speaking about. How many of you uh, watch sports? You care about sports? You, okay, perfect. Uh, how many of you saw the uh, – I'm not a Cardinal fan, so I have to tell you. That my ex-wife was a Cardinal. I don't want to go there. Uh, <laughs> What's the, uh, what's the first thing that happened immediately after the San Francisco Giants won game seven of that playoff game? What's one of the first? Obviously, the players got together and started jumping around. But as the cameras came in, what's one of the first things that happened? If you can answer this right, uh, you can come up and do the rest of the presentation. Started lighting cars on fire. Uh, OK, not, not the uh, people <laughs> out in San Francisco. <laughs> Right. How about the uh, the players themselves? Anyone can think of one of the first thing. I'll give a little. Yes, first name in the back. I didn't see it, but did they throw their arms up in the air? Sure. Okay, that's true, and that's kind of ritual. But uh, uh, water on people. not really. I'm kind of giving a, a hint. 
of, Jack, let me have your hat, okay? Uh, adorning with crowns. Uh, you watch a Super Bowl. You watch an NBA championship. LeBron James did it immediately upon the Miami Heat. The first thing they're doing is putting on that hat that has uh, NBA champion. It has National League uh, pennant winners, right? So I think you can make that extension almost to that to that crown. Uh, Rich, uh, how about boxing? What's one of the first things they do at the end of uh, any championship bout? The belt, right? So that, that we see this parallel to what Angela was putting up there from the Greeks. And I know, Jack, you were getting very nervous that I was going to take that bull's hat, right? Uh, but we see that same kind of a thing taking place, right? That there's a ritualistic adorn, right? There's there's putting on that hat, there's putting on that belt that's going to separate the athlete, the champion especially, from uh, the non-athlete. Okay, so I think that's a good way to start. And how about uh, if we move, that, I thought that was a nice, uh, a nice kind of introduction into what I was going to be uh, speaking about. And it's going to really fit with maybe one of the, uh, one of the, there's one little uh, PowerPoint thing that takes about four minutes that I'm going to beg you to let me show because uh, if you if you don't cry, you're not human, I'll argue, and I think it, it really gets at this idea of moral virtue and what sports is supposed to reflect, not what it necessarily does. Uh, okay, so let's try, uh, Angela, can you click on this one, how bad, as an example of ritual? Perfect. I hope this is going to be, I hope it's going to be Ray Lewis. You know, he wanted to make a lot of money, and so he went to this guru, right? He told the guru, you know, I want to be on the same level you are. All right, so I'll said, tell you what, you we could click out of this one. It'll take too long. I'll meet you tomorrow at the beach. Can we X out? Yeah. How about this one? Pump up? Uh, Corn buckle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's go pump up. I think this is the one. Whoops. Oh, no, no. That's <laughs> stealing my thunder, not that pumping Sorry. up. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Let's not go there. Okay. Okay. That, this is what I want. Thank you. This is perfect. All right, this is perfect. Really pay attention. All right, this just takes a minute. Perfect answer. That's, per that's perfect. We could, Angela, you could stop there. I really can't take Tim Tebow. I don't even know why I put that on there, but uh, it, because it would, he performs a ritual. Ritual, and that I, that was per I just can't do it. I just can't do it this late in the afternoon. But you saw Ray Ray Lewis, right, and Drew B Brees, perfect examples. If you went to any football field from junior football league right up into the NFL, you're going to see that ritualistic performance, right, right before kickoff. You're going to see those athletes. You're going to see it during calisthenics. And then right before those refs uh, blow the whistle, the kickoff's going to start. You're seeing a perfect example of ritual. You can see it in baseball from, again, little league all the way up to the major leagues where the kids are going to come together around the coach. The players are going to come around the manager. They're going to be chanting. They're going to be, you know, pumping their fists, going to be doing a whole series of things. And that's from whether we're talking about four-year-olds to 40-year-olds, right? So I thought that was a, a good depiction of the idea of ritual before a sporting event. Okay, I think uh, the hornbuckle one, we don't need to go. If I could go to the, our next slide, Angela, I hope. Hello. There. Okay, all right. Now, uh, I think this is another thing off of Angela's uh, Angela's presentation, and and it fits with that idea of of uh, praise and and uh, the champion and signification, and sports is supposed to be imbued with some kind of virtue. So if we we don't have to, uh, 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 yeah, we can do the Ray Lewis. How about that? Okay, and I'll make a real contrast here, right? You know, sometimes God removes you from thinking about games all the time. You know, and there was this kid. 
that I've been really mentoring, uh, Jesus. And he felt the pain in his shoulder. He realized he had bone cancer. And I've been helping him out. Lord rest in peace, Jay. And I've been helping him out as much as I could. And last week, you know, his mother called me and said, Jay is really ill. Jay is really going through it. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to get over it as soon as this game is over. You know? And uh, I got the phone call yesterday morning. Well, yesterday. And Jay didn't make it. You know? 17-year-old kid. So sometimes that's why you got to you got to sum up game sometimes and say how important is life really? Because this is a 17-year-old kid that was just waiting for me to come speak to him. But a game pulled me away from that. All right, that's perfect, oh, Angela. If we could stop that, right? 17-year-old kid died, but the game took me away from that. If we could just go down to the next, uh, uh, that's... Jim Rohn? Uh, no, that won't... Okay, let me make the contrast, all right? Let me do this. Well, here's Ray Lewis, and this is a contemporary picture of him. And if you know anything about Ray Lewis and his biography, he's become one of 17-year NFL. He's going to go into the Hall of Fame, one of the most famous linebackers, certainly of this generation, in the history of the NFL. But there's been a real a conscious attempt to reconstruct his biography. Right now, he's one of the most sought-after um, motivational speakers. I mean, you can't help but be riveting when that, the charisma that he just evokes, the way he plays on the field. But the, the other side, the reason for having to reconstruct and imbue this moral virtue, look what he said, right? That we need to start thinking about the worth of, I, I couldn't be there for a 17-year-old kid for whom I've, with whom I've formed a bond because I had, to, I had to take part in an NFL game. And the clip I wanted to show, and it, it takes about two minutes, I, I got some other things I want to show, is Diane Sawyer doing the report um, many of you may have forgotten by now at the Super Bowl in Atlanta, Ray Lewis was charged as an accessory to a murder, right? That he, he at, at the very least, without question, he witnessed the murder and did nothing to stop it, okay? And he pled out to a lesser charge, and that is completely deconstructed. You never hear that as part of his biography now, right? He's found God. He's become a motivational speaker. He's... he's He's done all the things a PR firm would love, right, to clean up his act with very positive results, right? So I, I, I took that clip specifically to show this idea of moral virtue, but reconstructing the athlete's profile, right, from convict, potentially convicted murderer to sought-after public speaker and motivational person. Uh, can, I do, can we do this Which one? This, yeah, and then I'll just talk that one. This is only like a minute. This hey, is perfect. Everybody. I want to talk to you about what Live Strong Day means to me. October 2nd is the day I was diagnosed with cancer and thrown into the fight of my life. I made it through okay, but today, 15 years later, cancer is the world's leading cause of death. Too many people around the world are fighting for their lives right this minute without the resources, treatment, and support they need. We have to change that. Today, Live Strong Day is a challenge. A global day of action where we stand together and declare that we won't quit and we won't retreat from the fight against cancer. It's a day when we wear yellow to show the strength of our community and to encourage others to join us in the fight. Show your support. Wear yellow with me on October 2nd. Join the fight at livestrong.org slash livestrongday. Lance Armstrong has raised billions of dollars for the fight against cancer. I took this clip. Perfectly. Why would I take that one in light of the last week? Moral virtue. You couldn't. One of the most heroic, seven-time Tour de France champion. One of the most. One of the most recognized athletes in the world. Why would I put him up there for moral virtue? Anybody read the paper in the last week, Adam? His medals. Excuse me. His medals. Completely stripped of all his medals. Uh, he's been fighting the uh, USADA, the United States Anti-Doping Agency, who's alleged that he's taken part in all kinds of, of using banned substances, procedures that would en enhance his performance. He's denied, he's denied, he's denied, he's denied, spent millions of dollars fighting the case. And about three weeks ago, he just said, I'm going to stop fighting. And now a whole series of his teammates have come forward and said they were complicit. He definitely doped. He, he asked them to dope with him, and he asked them to hide what he did the moral virtue, and then the fall of the athlete, right? I took Ray Lewis and Lance Armstrong as a perfect example. On one hand, embodying virtue, and on the other hand, the demise, right? Uh, this one, 
we don't need to clip on, right? I, if uh, if you you know more NCAA Division One uh, victories than anyone until about a year ago, right? And then some of those victories were stripped, and then uh, three people, one person already put away, and two people who still await trial for essentially helping to at least institutionally sanction the rape of boys, right? So. Uh, you know, one of the most respected, iconic sports figures, Virtue, gave millions of dollars. The Penn State Library is named after Joe Paterno, right? The height, again, of moral virtue, always speaking about the positive role of, edu of education in athletics, and his whole image is now tarnished. Who's going to associate the word virtue with Joe Paterno, rightly or wrongly, in light of his behavior and the potential it's still to be found in the courts, right, of their complicity in allowing, uh, using Penn State uh, as an institution where this kind of behavior could be sanctioned, could be take, could be taking place, right, and and fostered. Perfect. Uh, can we go to the next Lance one? Lance Armstrong is an even an even more apt example because it was the status of his body that wrecked his virtue because his body was found to be full of chemicals right, right. that he put there. Perfect. Perfect point. Uh, oh, can we just go to that clip, the Giants? Here's a, again with the idea of crowning and, and being recognized. Entering Super Bowl 42. Uh, you can go, uh, Angela, we can go really far, I think. And we just want to see where he gets the, uh, you're good, you're good, you're good. I just want to see him getting off the field. I think we're almost there. You're almost there. Okay, there you go, right there. Good. Can you start? Right? There's the hat. Already has it. The game isn't even seconds old. Already had his uh, NFL Super Bowl champions on. They, Michael Strahan. The hat already on. There you go, right? Holding the medal, as it were, right? Like the crowning. Perfect. That's good, Angela, right there. Perfect. Okay. And then I, we don't need to show that one. That was just the one I quizzed you on that you did poorly on, not knowing that the Giants uh, put on their hats immediately. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay. I'm begging. you got to – this – if you can spare me four minutes, it's worth it. I just hope you have a handkerchief. That's all I'll tell you. Angela, we're gonna, they're, they're, not, they're not walking out, so we're going to do it. Imagine being a teenage girl, thinking about the day you'll get your driver's license, going to see movies with your friends, playing sports you love. Now imagine that all changes because of a degenerative and untreatable disease. That is exactly what happened to a young woman I met recently. But thanks to one Just think of the word virtue friend, in this. Back to doing what she loves. 16-year-old Sammy Stoner loves running with her dog, Chloe. But Sammy and Chloe aren't any ordinary Thank you, partners. Andrew. Chloe is Sammy's guide dog. Sammy, a high school cross-country athlete, is blind. How long have you been running? I've been running since I was in eighth grade, way before I, my vision started going bad. For months, she and her family didn't know what was causing the decline. It was a pretty tough time. I think it was tough on Sammy. It was definitely tough on us. She was diagnosed with Stargardt's disease, an inherited condition that causes central vision loss and renders its sufferers legally blind. Losing her sight has been so trying for someone so young. There was one thing that you could see just, just one more time and have a good look at one more time. What would that be? Probably my family's faces. It's kind of tough not being able to see their face or my face. It's I think we've not known what you look like. In a in a bigger depiction of this for E60 for ESPN, she said she's never really seen herself in a mirror. Day because I mean that's something every teenager looks forward to. Running was still an option. If you love something enough, then you'll find a way to do it, even if you do have struggles with it. And Sammy doesn't just run, she runs cross country through the woods for miles on end. <laughs> That's where Chloe came in. 
since sammy got her last summer, they've been training nonstop, learning to move together and build up chloe's endurance. it's hard enough to get a person to be dedicated enough to run. i can't imagine what it would require of a puppy, nonetheless. it's been a huge learning experience, but she really is doing a great job. the state initially wouldn't let sammy and chloe run on the team. stacy. but the school fought for her and won. we devised a plan where she could possibly run in a competitive situation in a sanctioned event. meanwhile, chloe was fitting right in on the team. watch as she takes part in this pre-race ritual. ritual, right? we have forty eight runners on the team and then we came chloe, so we're a family of forty nine runners. come here chloe. and though she is all work on the course, when the harness does come off, she changes her demeanor change. Uh -huh. she is one playful pup. you're irresistible. <laughs> finally, after all of their hard work, the time came for sammy and chloe to run their race. first time she ran with chloe, everybody was oh, cheering. Wow. Oh, <laughs> That day, Sammy ran her personal best. That's the best she's ever run. And in the end, this inspiring team and her pup achieved their goal and crossed the finish line together. She just faces every day with the most positive attitude we could ever hope. I'm really happy we can be an inspiration to people because you really can do anything. That's and Sammy that's is good, the Angela. I've ever met. Smile ear to ear. I'm sorry, I, I'm still choking. I'm like a ridiculously sensitive male. I hate it. Uh, after, I, when you watch the extended version, is uh, my oldest daughter is a graduate student came in and goes, Dad, what the hell is the matter? I was like sobbing where I just couldn't even get. If you see, uh, this is what I wanted to put in for virtue. Um, when you they do an, a more focused interview with the parents and something that this is more like a feel good story the parents share with them their daughter never finished anything other than last in every race that she ran in high school and you see them saying that and they're starting to like break down but you can feel and see the pride that they have in their daughter, as the coach saying, running her personal best. And to me, that depicts more the virtue that's in sports, right? Where the competition so often is from within, right? To see how far, here's a, a, a woman that's legally blind who is able to use that dog and strive each time out to do better and better to where she can achieve a personal best, but yet finish last, right? And I think that that's an interesting uh, kind of dichotomy. But to me, it captures the real virtue in sports, the competition in itself with you, with yourself. Cool. Thank you. I'm glad you guys didn't cry. Uh, all right. Well, virtue in sports, virtue. Let's go to this one. This is a good one. Tiger Woods, the most famous golfer in the world. And we're buffering. Uh, world, one of the most famous people in the world. One car accident, here's what we know about it. Happened here in Windermere. And you can tell this is an old clip, right? right? And I did it on purpose. He hit a tree. He was semi-conscious or unconscious for a number of minutes. His wife used a golf club to bash in the back window to rescue him. So those are the things we do know, but there's an awful lot we don't know. And we interviewed the chief of police here in Windermere, Florida, to get his take on what happened. He was on the ground, semi-unconscious, and uh, had lacerations to his upper and lower lip. So our first uh, response was to render first aid to him. We certainly don't know what happened. You know, the hospital says it was a minor injury. The injuries were just seen on his mouth. I mean, why do you think he was semi-conscious or unconscious? You know, I don't know. The, the officers that were there said he was semi-unconscious in and out of it for several minutes. Um, he did have blood coming out of his mouth. Um, but the officers also said he did not look life-threatening his injuries. The car was drivable, so why did his wife have to bash it in with a golf club? <laughs> From my understanding, she explained to my officers that the doors were locked and she could not gain entry. So yeah, she okay. used the golf club to smash the window off to gain entry that month. Did she have a golf club with her at the time? I don't know where the golf club came from. Yeah, I mean, she, she, she carries a nine iron. Everyone does. It sounds like that's part of what you do. I mean, does this sound, you know, I, I certainly don't want to put words in your mouth, but does this sound a little unusual and suspicious, this case? <laughs> it sounds unusual, like I said, we're not the investigating agency, so you know we were first responders on our mutual way to help him out, 
And we didn't know it was Tiger Woods. We just knew that there was a male down. There's certainly still a lot more investigating to do. In charge of the investigation now is the Florida Highway Patrol because this happened in an unincorporated part of Orange County, Florida, not actually within the town limits of Windermere. That's fine. There's That's fine, Angela. One call. And the reason, I think you can guess the reason I took this one, the three of the most recognized athletes in the world, Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, and Tiger Woods, and I couldn't find the, the uh, I, I couldn't find this image, but I wanted to get it's a famous uh, uh, Christmas card of Tiger Woods, his then what now ex-wife, their two children, and I if I, I can't remember if it's one or two golden retrievers, and it's like an idyllic you couldn't get a better Christmas card, perfect smiles, idyllic family, and then I just wanted to juxtap juxtapose it with the. Uh, a golf club going through the back when right kind of the fall from grace right these the putting athletes up on a pedestal almost godlike right and then finding out uh, that sometimes the emperor is you know has no clothes right that uh, I, I, I'm not gonna this is a uh, the malice in the palace a riot breaks out uh, I wish I, I don't want to take up a lot of time the, the, the first one is you know it only runs about a minute or two. Can I just show it real quick? It's black and white, which I like. Do you, I don't know if you remember black and white. Some of you out there. Played, it was no, no big thing for the game. We played Houston. The Lakers was a hell of a team to play against. They had the physical play. They had the speed. There was a lot of a lip service that was going on. I know I remember having lip service with Kermit. The game was uneventful. I, I, I think, remember, in the second half or something, the ball goes up. This will be we'll real quick. I promise we'll stop. Rebounded. And I think it was me, Kevin Cooner, and Kareem went for a rebound. Ball got us long, and Houston was running on a fast break. We're coming down on a fast break. John Lucas has the ball. Uh, Rudy's filling one lane. I'm filling the other. I foul Kevin trying to get in front of him. I grab his hip and try to propel myself in front of him to catch up to you know, the guys that were going out of court. Which wasn't out of the ordinary. We've all done it. I've done it a thousand times. Well, he elbows me with his left elbow in the face. But the elbow's not to hurt. It's to, you know, man, get off. So when he turned around, I was going to say, I'm really sorry, but he turned around and hit me in my face again. Then I said, well, he, that's not a mistake. So then we start swinging on each other. The instinct for any, any player, when you see an incident like that, is he grabs Just watch. What, I, I promise it's like it's another 30 game. seconds to stop the fight, so that, that's what I did. And he pushes Kermit away. Now, Rudy King, of course, who's the captain of the Rockets, was still in one lane. He, he's running towards Jabbar and Kevin to calm Kevin down. Now, you got to watch but right Kermit, here. Kermit, who's backing up, looks over his shoulder. He turned and saw Rudy running toward him, and base his instinct was just to turn and swing. He stopped, plants, and I saw the punch coming, and Rudy was running and soft punch coming also and threw his hands up to protect it and of course the punch comes over it and oh, you could stop it right there I can't uh, I didn't see it if, if you don't uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar compares it to here a, a grapefruit uh, just being completely smashed and Rudy Tomjanovich his career was never uh Broke so many, he had to have major plastic surgeries, it effectively ended his career. If you saw his head whiplash, right? It hit, and this is this is wooden uh, gym floors, then not like today where they're cushioned and stuff. And uh, again, the idea of heroism and virtue, and how does that square with an incident like that, right? I'm, I'll, I'll explain at the end why I keep doing this. I think we only have one more. Oh, the athletic body, uh, let's do. Let's do Chris. Uh, no, let's do Mr. Olympia. Let's do that. Because I think this fits with. Uh, uh, Bad. Uh, Been chopping trees. I've done nope, so No, that won't do it. Fight. I got the wrong one there. Uh, all right, let's do Amanda Baird. We'll do her. Real quick. Yeah, this will be good. Does anyone know? Does everyone know who Amanda Baird is? Uh, she broke on an uh, Olympic swimmer, uh, really came to notoriety, I believe, in the 96 Olympics. 14-year-old, amazing uh, gold medal winner. Well, why do you have these up there? Okay, it always, <laughs> all right, uh, the body as temple. Uh, but to me, in a sociology class, it always raises the image. Uh, the issue, and I really enjoyed, I'm always amazed by some of the opinions women have of, is she being... 
are women athletes taken seriously for their athletic prowess, or is, is it that they're using their athletic prowess uh, to peddle themselves and, and, and market themselves in terms of potential careers as models, etc.? Amanda Baird raised some notoriety here because uh, she was one of the first swimmers uh, to accept a Playboy centerfold and adamantly said that she believed that she was being a positive role model for young women. She was proud of her body and had no problem whatsoever. She understood why, pe why people could criticize her, but uh, nonetheless, she did it. I, I think I must have uh, in it, I must have messed up my uh, my uh, files because I had one of like male bodybuilders. Any of you have ever seen a bodybuilding competition? What do, what do the guys have? Oil, right? They literally oil their body. So I thought it would have been a, a perfect thing. Somehow I got Muhammad Ali in an oil clip. I don't know how I messed that one up. So I apologize for my lack of technological sophistication. Uh, all right, let's go to the, uh, I think I have one more. Uh, mind and body, okay? And, you know, we always hear this thing about the, I promise I'll, I'll bring this to a conclusion here. We hear about this idea of the mind and body and the Greeks thinking they, these things should be on the same level. And, uh, it, again, I, I defer to any, I, you people have forgotten more than I may know about Greek or, or the, uh, the Greeks or the or Greek ideas of sports, but many Greek philosophers were actually critical of athletic figures in that they said they overdid the cultivation of their bodies and did not do enough to be cultivating their minds. So I thought a perfect example here, and we don't have to show the clip, uh, of maybe the Greek ideal was Andrew Luck, right, who stayed in school, uh, for uh, got his degree at Stanford, uh, was someone being thought about for a Rhodes Scholarship, uh, was, uh, received numerous awards, academic, all-American, right, kind of fitting the ideal of that harmony between mind and body, right? Now, obviously, this is the exception, especially at the, the Division I sports level, but it kind of embodies that ideal of mind and, and body going hand in hand. I think we have, may, I think I may have one more. Oh, and then the final thing is, and this was definitely true of the Olympic Games in ancient Greece, the athletes uh, were supposed to reflect positively on the particular city-states that they represented, right? And I think we find a parallel, certainly in modern day Olympics, so that uh, we, uh, I just took these still shots, there's no YouTube, I think you all know that's Brandy Chastain, and that's not the typical picture that we see. The typical picture is usually Brandy Chastain doing what? Right, pulling her shirt off and revealing her Nike sports bra, and that's the iconic picture. But th th to me, the more important was, this is after uh, the, the US women and uh, who helped bring women's soccer right to the forefront after a victory uh, running around with the American flag. And we see this in almost any victorious, any athlete who's victorious in the, in the Olympics, grabbing that flag, running the track, right? Getting up on the pedestal, being crowned with the medal, right? And then I thought another good iconic picture was the dream team uh, with uh, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Larry Bird, Clyde Drexler, you see him adorning themselves. Now this is interesting though from a sociological point of view because they're draping themselves in the American flag also to uh, hide the logo of Adidas because Michael Jordan uh, is a Nike sponsor, right? And that was how he got the rest of the team to, uh, you know, to agree to put the flag around them, right? So that it wasn't just to evoke nationalism, it was so that he kept on the good side of Nike, right, as, as their principal spokesperson. I don't think, do I have one more? Okay, I, I just wanted to conclude this way. Uh, and I appreciate it. Can I get a little hand for Angela? Because I couldn't have done that. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. Uh, I just wanted to conclude this way. I, the reason I kept uh, doing kind of these parallels is I had a student one time in my sociology of sport class go, Dr. Eckert, do you ever talk about anything positive about sports? And it really struck me. The question has always been with me. Uh, and, I, and I had to answer. I go, I feel like we take the positive for granted. We take that idea of virtue. We take of the idea of sports building character. We take those kinds of things for granted. And we don't, I think, critically assess 
but isn't there a downside to some of this, right? So, so I, I think any any time I give a talk uh, about sports, I come off as if I'm not, I'm very much, I, I think there's so many positive things about sports, but I, I think it's always important to look at that contrast between that ideal of what we think sports are about versus the reality that we see when we, uh, we subject sports to a sociological lens, right? We look at it a, a little bit more critically. So I wanted to thank Angela very much, and I really want to thank my former student, Chris Duncan, for putting these slides. But he, I am changing his grade. That Muhammad Ali slide got in there. I'm going to change the grade. advisedly, is an embodiment of virtue, areti. Virtue is both a moral concept, moral worth, but also a physical concept. So the physical is meant to reflect the moral. So physical beauty, strength, perfection, uh, both in how you look and how you perform, is meant to reflect on your moral worth. From a ritual standpoint, the athlete is both sacrificial victim. If sport is a ritual sacrifice, that's what's being sacrificed. It's his bodily energy, blood, sweat, and tears. And he's the sacrificer. So he's this interesting dual position. Whoever is the winner, the champion, is worthy of being dedicated to the gods. And so the bodily signs of the ritual status of the athlete that I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to talk about three. There are other things we could say. But three is always a nice number for these kinds of presentations. So the first one is nudity. The second one, anointing with olive oil, which is such a prominent part of Greek athletics. And then decoration with crowns, like you know, laurel leaves, olive leaves, and fillets, these woolen bands. And you can see in this illustration, I think you can see a little bit the red color. This athlete here, and you can tell he's the athlete because he's the nude one, is being decorated with woolen bands and fillets, and we'll talk about the status of that. And I, I do want to say, if there are any classic scholars in the room, I would love it if you would chime in, because um, I'm about up to here, you know, in terms of my expertise. I don't, I don't necessarily have a handle on this, except for the ways in which ancient practices resonate with modern Greek culture, and I would say modern Greek culture, since that's my research interest, um, is very revealing and, and can tell us an awful lot about the way in which we bring those ideas forward into contemporary times. So the status of sport in ancient Greece, I'm borrowing some notions from a classic scholar from up the road in Urbana, David Sansone, who describes sport in ancient Greece as a ritual sacrifice of human energy. And this is kind of a provocative statement, um, but I think it's a really useful one. It helps us understand just that incredibly important role that sport played in ancient Greek society, um, which has resonances with today, and Craig's going to talk more about that. Uh, we see it in uh, not just the status of the body in sport, but in you know what, what was at stake, what were people striving for. Um, you see here in this picture, these two wrestlers are competing over that cup. It's a sacrificial vessel. Might this be the origin of the Stanley Cup? Sacrificial vessels were a very common form of prize, so we start to see this intertwining of ritual aspects and sport. In other words, sport is not separate from ritual or religious activity. Sporting events were at their heart religious events. So if sport is a ritual sacrifice of human energy, then what's the status of the athlete? And one of the things we can say about the athlete in Ancient Greece is that he, and I'm, I'm using the word, All right. thank you very much. Um, I was listening to this talk and thinking, how are we going to follow this? I, I can't see the connection, but now I can because of the last comment you made. You know, I'm not an evolutionary anthropologist, but my, I think my colleagues would say we, we are in some ways a product of human technology because there's so much research about the ways in which human evolution is intertwined with tool use. So we are kind of, in part, self-made and, and prosthetic in that sense. So I think that's really provocative. 
because the subject that Craig and I are going to talk about is um, body and sport in Greek antiquity and today. And the first thing I want to say is I'm not a classic specialist and I'm not a specialist in sports, but I am an anthropologist who's very much interested in uh, what the body can tell us about the status of the person in society. And so that's my kind of my segue into this subject matter. Um, that's that's something that I'm interested in, and I and I think about continually. What about the the body and the way the body is conceptualized and talked about, and the practices of the body? What do they show us about the status of the person in a particular society? And clearly, um, from everything we can see about the way the body is is used and depicted uh, in in Greek culture and ancient Greek practices. All right, so nudity, clearly the word for nudity, the word for naked in Greek, gymnos, gives us gymnastics, gymnasium. Being naked, you know, is a characteristic of being an athlete. That's, the words are interchangeable because of this tight connection. Sansone speculates that this may be connected to initiation rituals, although he's not entirely sure. And so this, this line drawing taken from a a Greek ceramic shows athletes getting nude, anointing themselves with that olive oil, preparing. Nudity then is, you know, a way of setting off, um, marking yourself as distinctive. Athletes applied olive oil before competition, and then they would scrape it off along with all the sweat and the dust afterwards with this tool called a strigil, and that's what this athlete's doing in this picture. What's interesting is that Greeks also anointed statues of gods. And I hope you can hear when I'm using the word anoint and I'm using that word deliberately, we have a lot of ritual connotations with this word, right? It came through. Christianity, right? Christos means the anointed one. So this carries over. We have a lot of associations with anointing. So if, if athletes are anointed in a special way, they're marking the body. Something special is happening here. Now the woolen fillets, what's interesting, here on the right is an athlete who's wearing woolen bands, red woolen bands. Over here, it's a little harder to see, but these women are decorating sacrificial bulls with woolen fillets. So this is the aspect of the athlete as sacrificial victim. That's what's being highlighted, being decorated with the same kind of thing, drawing it into the same context. And of course, the crowns of laurel and olive, which are such a symbol of victory. And again, Christian thought borrowed those, right? In a lot of different contexts, martyrs as victors being crowned. Again, these crowns of vegetation, they could be olive leaves, they could be laurel leaves. These are also ritually important. Priests and priestesses would wear these crowns in the context of conducting sacrifice. And here you see a victorious athlete offering a burnt sacrifice. And here's the winged goddess. Nike, we would say. I wouldn't say that personally in Greek pronunciation, but that's how we know her winged victory. So again, you see that the athlete is both sacrificial victim and sacrificer, marked out by bodily signs, nudity, 